So Gassi, I think, uh, yes, he did a PhD from uh, FGIA in Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. right. And then she moved to the University of California for a postdoc like two years ago. And uh, for, for your information, so today she will talk about the result of Herschel, particularly in sublimation. And uh, so, and in Canada, the Physics Institute is uh, involved in, uh, in the Herschel surveys of star formation with uh, CETA and uh, Victoria. And today she will present her class from Victoria telling you all about the exciting results of Herschel. Uh, That's true. Okay. All right, thank you, Kwang, for the invitation and thank you, CETA, for also the invitation and hosting me here. Um, I first will start out just listing my long list of collaborators. So James D. Francesco is also at um, NRC in Victoria. Peter Martin is here. Chris Wilson is at McMaster. Sarah Sadovoy is a PhD student at UVic. She's moving to NCIA in the fall. Mike Reed is also U of T. And then, of course, my collaborators who I will be working with this week while I'm here, Kwong here, and Mobti I, I just saw here. <laughs> Um, and then I list the PIs of the project, Philippe André and Frédéric Mott, of the Herschel key programs that I will be discussing the observations with um, today. And I'm going to preface this talk with the fact that I had a medical emergency last week, and so I did not have the time to properly prepare or develop the talk to my liking. Um, with that said, I, if it's fine with me, if you would like to interrupt, ask questions during the talk, we can discuss. I'm open to that if I have to be flexible uh, with the timing, I'm willing to do that. So when I was invited here, um, I promised Kwong that I would not talk about the 780 sources in my catalog, uh, nor the 224 sources that we, um, that we further characterized, looked at the SCDs of. And nor of the 13 sources which we found interesting for further uh, for follow up as possible sites of intermediate to high mass star formation. And looking around the room, nobody's fallen asleep yet. This is good. <laughs> and I promise not to talk about my catalogs anymore. So, what I will talk about today is just an introduction to the Herschel Space Telescope, Space Observatory. Um, so, this is the instrument, the telescope that most or all of the observations from this talk today came from. And then I will discuss a little bit about the Gould Belt Survey. This is one of the key programs that I've been involved with as a postdoc. Uh, so it's, this is a key program from the Herschel uh, collaboration. And specifically, I will talk about uh, several of the regions within the Cepheus flare. And then I will talk about the Herschel OB Young Stellar Object Survey, also called HOBIES because we love acronyms. And the region that I have been focusing on is NGC 7538. So I will show you some of the really neat results that have come about from that region. And then also others within the collaboration, some of the results from Rosette, Vela C. I will mention at the end if there is time. So the Herschel Space Observatory, this is a three and a half meter diameter telescope that was launched in May of 2009. Um, and so it was put at the second Lagrange point of the Sun-Earth system. So this is out uh, in solar orbit beyond the uh, several times further away from, uh, from the moon's orbit. And its projected uh, lifetime was three, three and a half years. This is based on the amount of liquid helium that it had as coolant for the instrument. And so we were um, happy, surprised that it lasted almost four years. And just at the end of April, uh, it ran out of this coolant and so uh, no longer took data. And then just last week, um, it finally was moved to its final resting place and we uh, stopped contact with it. Um, but this was truly a, an amazing observatory for what it produced. 
um, scientifically for us. Um, so the primary science goals of Herschel were to look at the cool universe, so formation of galaxies and stars, um, ISM physics, solar system objects. And so today what I'm going to focus on is the star formation aspect of that. And so, um, so protostars, um, the peak of their spectral energy distribution occurs right in the wavelength regime of the Herschel instrument, uh, of the Herschel instruments. So Herschel has um, the two instruments that were used uh, for the projects, which I will talk about today, are called PAX and FIRE. And PAX spans a wavelength from 70 to 160 micron. And then SPIRE takes over and observes 250 micron to 500 micron. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so that's the, the peak of these protostellar objects. And so it's good for uh, determining, um, so we can determine spectral energy distributions, the peak of the spectral energy distribution with this instrument. So it's out in space and has a very uh, three and a half meter diameter mirror. Um, so we also get very high sensitivity with this instrument. And the maps that were produced with Herschel were truly amazing. And so I will show you some of those later. Um, but, okay, so Herschel probes thermal emission from the cold dust. So we get very high angular resolution. Um, and uh, has a large dynamic range. So um, we can tell, so in the star formation regions that we're looking at, we have um, diffuse uh, regions, we have um, filamentary structures, and we are able to look at all of these structures over the, the range of their uh, dynamic range um, with Herschel. And so we are looking at so the regions that I'm looking at, we have something on the order of one square degree. And this takes on the order of um, an hour to, to scan at the, um, uh, to produce the maps that I will show today. Um, then let's see. Okay, so the first project which I will talk about is the Gould Belt Survey. And so this was a project looking at low mass star formation, specifically at the initial mass function. So we want to know, we, 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 know, that the initial, we know what the initial mass function looks like. We want to know where that comes from. Do, um, do starless cores, do they follow that? And is it just a transition from starless core down to the initial mass function where, the, where they reach the main sequence. Um, so here we have just the, the sequence of low mass star formation. So we start out as a starless core. We can determine between these, um, these stages based on the spectral energy distribution. And so it starts out as a starless core, then you get a protostar and we go through based on what wavelengths it's observed at. Um, class zero, class one, class two, class three. So this is just an evolutionary sequence here. And let's see. Okay, so this is, this is one of the, the focus of the Gould Belt Survey. So here, these first two, the starless cores and the class zero protostars is what, how we would like to distinguish um, using the data from the Gould Belt Survey. And so I will just back up in a bit. So first things first, we have to determine sources within the mass. And so the, the method that we used to do that was developed for this, uh, over the course of the Herschel um, project. And so, um, so Sasha Henschkoff uh, in, at Sarpe developed the program Get Sources. And so this was adopted based on tests with other uh, source extraction methods. And so we have 
uh, adopted that method to determine sources within our maps. And so this determines sources. It looks at um, all of the wavelengths that we have available with uh, all of the Herschel wavelengths. And so that's the multi-wavelength um, aspect of this. And it's also able to determine, um, so filaments, it's uh, within, within these maps. And so one thing that once I show you the maps, you will see that they are quite filamentary. So there is a lot of filamentary structure. And so we determine the sources as well as we can map the filaments and further analyze that um, together. So here are the, um, the here are the Cepheus flare regions which I am studying. Uh, this is part of the Gould Belt Survey. So these are all low mass regions. The Cepheus flare is approximately 300 parsecs away, so that's very close. And so these regions offer us very high spatial resolution because uh, with the, the high um, angular resolution of Herschel, and then combined with their close distance, we have quite good resolution. Um, so here, mostly, I just put maps. So um, in, in the top, we have the, the green sources are uh, Spitzer, um, Spitzer catalogs, which, so we will compare those to what we determine with the, with, um, with the Herschel source finding algorithm. And then I put some three color images here below, um, which I will, um, so this is something that I would like to work on further. And so I just put the preliminary three color images here. And then here are the other three regions. There's five regions in, within the Cepheus flare. And I will point out specifically this region here, L1172. This is a region that Kwong and I plan to work on more this week. And um, so you see just here the, the bright um, H2, just interesting. OK, so for um, so H2, so it's um, probably, well, so it's star forming region and just very bright. I don't think, um, I'm not sure. So I don't think that there, there are no O stars there, but there probably is a, a B star. Okay, so for this week, one, so these are kind of our project goals. Um, I would like to determine the source concentrations. So within these maps, we have, we have the, the, the catalog of sources, and I would like to look at the radial profiles of, of these sources and see whether we can determine based on the radial profile, so how concentrated they are, like whether there is um, and based on the shape of that radial profile to see whether it's all squished into the center to see if it's more distributed um, uh, at further radii. And from that, we hope to determine where, um, so we hope to be able to distinguish between prestellar and protostellar uh, objects. We also have to determine between extraneous objects, like we are not interested in galaxies or evolved stars. And so, um, so this is a technique which I have not yet developed, but that I hope to do so this week and see um, what we can glean from that analysis. Um, I would also like to look, so let me just go back here. So there's quite a bit of just filamentary structure, especially here. We can see filaments there, filaments here, um, all the way down there. And so I would like to um, analyze that filamentary structure with respect to the, the sources that we find in the, um, in the regions. And so I'm just curious whether we find so that the, 
to see whether the sources are aligned with the filaments, whether it's a random uh, orientation, whether it's not aligned, like uh, preferentially not aligned. Um, so that's another uh, path that I hope to go down uh, with this project. Um, Kwong is interested in looking for multiplicity in these objects, and so clearly we have um, so many of these objects which we find are probably made up of multiple components and will break it apart eventually into multiple um, stars. Um, so these regions here are some of the um, uh, closer regions. Again, there are 270 something parsecs. And so with that distance, we hope to look closer, higher resolution, and see um, and just characterize that multiplicity. And then something that I put up here, which is um, maybe not scientifically driven, but create aesthetically pleasing three color images. And I do think that this has an important um, benefit because I, um, so we here are scientists and we talk to the scientific community, but part of Herschel was to make it accessible to the public to, um, and I think it is our part of what we need to do as scientists to um, make things that get the public really interested in what we are researching. So now I will move on to, okay, so the Gould Belt Survey is, I, um, has kind of been a background project for the last couple of years. I haven't devoted much time to it. That's what I want to focus on this week. Um, but now I'm going to move on to HOBIES, the Herschel Imaging Survey of OB Young Stellar Objects, which is what I have mostly been focusing on uh, for the last while. And so this survey was to map um, 15 clouds forming high mass stars. Um, predominantly the closest ones, yet we do have to go to higher, larger distances because these high mass stars, um, uh, to get a larger sample of high mass stars, we have to go to larger distances. So this is um, the I said race map, and we had, yeah, 22 square degrees. Yeah. So this is a guaranteed time P program with Herschel. So let me just motivate this project by talking a little bit about high mass star formation. So they, so high mass stars provide a lot of energy into the, uh, uh, into the, the, uh, the, the environment, their environment. Um, as they are forming, they have high mass, you know, so massive molecular outflows and um, which impact their surroundings significantly and possibly induce further star formation in their surroundings. Um, during their main sequence lifetime, they have strong stellar winds and they significantly heat their surroundings. At the end of their lifetime, they, these are the stars that will become supernovae and they will um, enrich the ISM. This is one mechanism. Uh, in which the ISM becomes enriched with heavy elements. And so the problem with observing high mass stars is that they tend to form in the center of clusters. And this is a very confused region. And because they are uh, rare as described by the initial mass function, we have to go to higher distances to get large samples of these high mass star formation regions. And so it just, these two, these two facts in combination make it difficult to observe these, and we consequently don't know as much about high mass star formation as we know about low mass star formation. And then another complicating factor, um, they, they form and evolve on very short time scales. And so, uh, again, this is just another complication with this here. Okay, so, we, are one, we, are, we wonder how high mass stars form, um, whether this is quasi-statically, dynamically, through coalescence perhaps of smaller objects. Um, and so 
So here, this is kind of a classic picture of low mass star formation, just a cartoon. But we start out with, uh, the, like I um, went through before, star with four, and then pre-stellar, class zero, all the way through class three. And so we want to know, is, a, is there a similar um, uh, set of um, uh, uh, transitions, or is there a similar transition for high mass star formation? And so for instance, do massive, so high mass, Pre-stellar cores exist. This is something we didn't know when Herschel uh, began, and that was one of the key drivers for this Hovey's program. There have been certainly several candidates that have come about through the Herschel through the Herschel observations, um, but I think it's still uh, open to um, to study here. And so then we see infrared quiet protostellar dense cores, infrared bright protostellar dense cores. So basically we can trace high mass um, star formation just based on uh, which, which wavelengths it becomes visible at. So, so with that in mind, Hovey's uh, mapped all of the major giant molecular clouds forming OB stars within three kiloparsecs. That was kind of the cutoff that was defined for this project. And so that included Rosette, Cygnus, Vela. NGC 7538 is one that I, the one that I focused on. M1617, W48, these are ones that Huang is working with, I believe, um, and a few others. So we wanted to identify and characterize the precursors of OB stars. So again, these pre-stellar these pre cores, do they exist? Do they have, um, so at what wavelength, um, okay, so, so pre-stellar, if, if it is pre-stellar, we should not be able to see it at 24 micron, 8 micron, anything beyond 70 micron even. Um, and so we would be able to see it at longer wavelengths, but then we also need to define it based on its density, um, based on its temperature. And so this is something that I have um, studied here. Um, so then we can also look into the, the lifetimes of each evolutionary stage. We look at the masses and the luminosities of these objects. And then another goal of the Hobie's prog program was to assess the efficiency of triggering. So triggering means that there is something that, um, something happening that triggers future generations of the star formation in the region. So here I just provide, I show the three color image of NGC 7538. So again, this right region here is an H2 region forming uh, high mass stars. And then I'd like to point out or bring to your attention this ring here. So this is something that we don't uh, see to such an extent, to such a large extent in, the other, uh, in other regions, even in other Hobie's regions. We see smaller rings um, and then there of course are catalogs of bubbles. Um, throughout the galaxy. Um, though this object here is something on the order of 10 parsecs. And so this is very large compared to other um, rings or bubbles that have been seen. And the other interesting thing about this is that we don't, so it's fairly evacuated within that ring. So it's, um, uh, so the density is lower within that ring compared to other uh, regions of the diffuse material here. And so this is something that I looked into heavily because I wanted to know what could have caused such a ring. And in the end, we looked at many different um, uh, possible causes and we were not really satisfied with any of the things that we, um, that we pursued. Um, one thing was looking for perhaps that it was um, 
uh, produced by a supernova or something, but then we would have expected to see something in the center of the ring. We looked into the possibility of there being a high mass star that was ejected or something, but, within, but looking within, um, so kind of that area within a few um, uh, degree or so, there, was, um, there were no likely candidates. And so this is still a mystery and yeah. Sure, so that was another thought that we had is maybe this is just a, um, so multiple um, things at different distances or different velocities or something, but we have CO data from JCMT and it very much looks like a coherent structure. So I think actually the next slide, yeah, I have that. So here I just put the, um, the ring, so this is zoomed in now on that ring. And so we have at 24 micron, 70 micron, and then so 70, 160, 250, 350, and 500 are all from Herschel. And then so this is to answer your question here. So this is JCMT uh, CO3 to 2 data. And so the, um, the velocity structure, it, it looks coherent across the entire um, velocity. So let me explain this plot in slightly more detail. So this is a channel map, which means that um, so this is two spatial axes and then a velocity um, uh, and then at several different velocities. And so here we have, um, uh, well, so here like minus 56 to minus 54. So anything that, any uh, material that is moving at that velocity would show up in this, in this channel here at the, at the higher velocities here and so on. And so we don't see any, so it looks like a coherent velocity structure, but we still don't see anything in the center of, uh, in the center of that ring. And um, let's see, I can say that the blue over, the blue contours here are the column density, and the red contours here are just all six of those channels integrated into one single map. So no matter how we look at this, this ring appears to be um, a single um, velocity entity and it appears to be void in the center. And so this is something that I'm still very curious about and um, I, I'm interested in hearing more ideas of what, of ideas for what could have caused this or how it could have formed or anything. Yes. Um, I don't, um, do you know how, how, like how would one look for that? So could, could you tell that from the CO data or would this require further observation? Um, yes, um, mass, something like 5,000 solar masses in, in the, the ring or so, I think. I, I, I have the numbers and I did this calculation, but I am not sure off the top of my head. Okay, so then. What I, I briefly mentioned this before was that if we look at the luminosity versus mass, we can determine between prestellar and protostellar. And so here we have mass on this axis, luminosity, solar luminosities on this axis here. And so this line here, this solid line, corresponds to um, L over M equals one. And so we, uh, so we use that as a delimiter as well as 40 solar masses here. And we, so anything in this shaded region here,
we consider to be an intermediate or high mass candidate for, sorry, a candidate for intermediate to high mass star formation. And so these are the objects which I um, paid most attention to, and these are the objects which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that I wasn't going to talk about. Um, but these are the ones that we are interested in follow-up observations to see uh, what the nature of these, uh, these specific objects is, is. And so then in this diagram here, I just simply plot the column density. So we have column density 10 to the 22, to 10 to the 23, roughly. And you can sort of see the distribution of the sources um, in this plot. And so the, the color coding, so the white are these objects which are in this shaded area here. Um, I highlight the ring right here. And so you see that there are quite a few objects um, forming in that ring structure. Um, and then the red, green, and blue correspond to which the peak wavelength in the SEB of that object is. So the, um, the greener, sorry, the blue, the blue objects have the uh, peak at the shortest wavelength in the, in, um, in the Herschel regime and the red objects are at the redder, peak at the redder wavelength. Okay, so that was, that was the, the Hobies project that I've been mostly concerned with. And so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the work that other people within the consortium have been involved with. So I put this here, this is the Rosette molecular cloud, and I put it here because it's just one of my favorite um, images that has come about from the Hobies um, work. So this is 250, 170, and 70 micron. Um, and let's see, so, and this is one of the regions that has been studied most, um, uh, most heavily within the Hobie's project. So I will just talk a little bit about some of the things that have come about. So um, let's see. So up here we have a group of, um, of O stars, so very bright. And, um, and so it's thought that these bright O stars are affecting the rest of this region here. And Let's see, so we have just rich clusters of young stars and populations of dense clumps. So this is uh, a dense clump here that we see of young stars. So for most of these regions, the general trend is to uh, produce, so first, um, so analyze the, the data, uh, reduce the data, of course, and then produce a dust temperature and a column density map. And so this is, here's the column density and here's the dust temperature. And so what we see in the dust temperature is a, um, yeah, I don't have the scale on here, but basically we have the, so you can see a temperature gradient in this map. So the warmer regions here um, are very close to these O stars and then we go to cooler regions here. And so, um, this is something that was, was studied whether, um, what, and, and how that affected the region and the star formation within the region. And so again, um, this is the plot of mass versus luminosity. And so again, we're, we're using this to distinguish between protostars and pre-stellar cores. Um, in the beginning stages of star formation. And so, um, so again, so we just see quite a few um, sources identified in this region here, both, uh, so class zero and class one. And, Um, so, um, basically, so we have temperatures, um, for the objects and then, um, 
Yeah, and then a fit to the to the spectral energy distribution with the Herschel the Herschel wavelength. At each wavelength. So this is the control of the magnetism. Yes. And then so when you have effectively a much more dense magnetism, you get much less magnetic magnetic radiation. Um So, um, so then to distinguish between um, a prestellar dense core and a starless core. So these are, um, so starless core would be the very first stage of, st of the star formation. Um, so we look at the size of the object versus the mass. So things that, um, uh, Okay, so basically, if it's if it's um, in a, a high enough mass and a small enough size, then we expect that it could possibly form a high mass star. And so, in this case, they um, use a cutoff of 40 solar masses within 0.02 to 0.3 parsec. And um, then these should also have high densities. Uh, so like 10 to the 5 and low temperatures. And so within this, um, so within rosette, we see nine good candidates to form high mass stars. So two are infrared bright, four are infrared quiet, and three are pre-stellar cores. So this is just, um, Okay, so these three massive pre-stellar cores are 0.22 parsec um, on average, about 30 solar masses, um, cold and dense, and these are the conditions exactly that we need to form an intermediate to high mass star. And so there were some, um, there were some projects that were um, applied for for telescope time to for high resolution follow up, but I don't believe that those were successful from uh, from weather standpoints. And so I believe this is something that we still need to follow up. And Rosette is looking for um, looking into the nature of these massive pre-stellar core candidates. So then also. One thing that we are interested in is whether this, whether star formation could be triggered. And so what this, we would see probably would be things that are all approximately at the same evolutionary stage. And um, so that we can look at using this mass versus luminosity diagrams. Um, and so what, what, uh, Nicola and Frederick found was that there was perhaps um, we see more evolved sources up close up here closer to these really bright O stars, and the youngest sources would be down here, um, further away from those O stars. But I think over the course of the of the several years um, since this was originally determined, I think that has been. Um, I think they have not been so strongly, I don't believe that as strongly anymore. Um, I think they just looked more at the, um, um, so just through further studies of the, of the data, I'm not sure. Um, So 
what Kwong said is as the source extraction algorithm developed, then different sources were um, uh, discovered and that uh, changed their view on this. So this is before there is um, a star. Right. So there, there is no star present there. This is something that may eventually evolve into a proto, a proto star. Um, I think so because there, because its internal um, heating source. Uh, has not yet been been developed. Well, when you say one protostar, mm -hmm. one star, mm -hmm. it's different from magnitude of one and what's the characteristic of um, so we're we're still talking something like 30, 30 Kelvin here. We're talking warm in comparison to fifteen of of, uh, of the molecular cloud here. So um, this is just a, a distribution of where we see starless objects, which are in red, so mostly up here, uh, versus the protostellar objects, which we see more clustered uh, in the in the brighter brighter regions. And so the idea was that along this this ring here, so up up in this region is where we had the the bright O stars. So the idea was that there would be triggering. Along that. Yeah, but one of the worries that there may be a fire in the sun and the stars are that that they're small filaments of steam. The attraction doesn't uh, look so immense to even though we have a filament mm -hmm. here that would be mm -hmm. enough to hit all these little atoms that are coming out of the core. Well, So I think originally there were a lot of biases in the get sources algorithm, but at, over time, I think it developed to be much more believable. And so it also it also finds these filaments. And so I think it, it does much better at subtracting the background now than it did say two, three years ago. Um, just by, so it, I mean this, the get sources algorithm was compared to a lot of other um, source extraction algorithms, whether that, you know, whether they would also have the same biases, maybe they would too. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I mean just looking at, um, so just plotting the sources and looking at them, it's true that we um, that most of them lie on the filaments. However, we would expect that most of the, the protostars and sun's cores would be in these filamentary areas. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, definitely. So there are. So I've looked and a lot of sometimes galaxies come through like background galaxies and it's true that there are many objects which probably are we are not interested in and that is definitely something that I have to pay a lot of attention to. Um, and I do, I do look at, um, so in the case of the NGC 7538, I did go through and look at the SUDs um, of all of the objects which were, um, uh, which were characterized. So yes, it's a very tedious process um, and yes, it does make mistakes, but that being said, it is much better than it was several years ago and I think we have to, it, and it, it certainly, in my opinion, is better than the other ones that are, the other get sor uh, source extraction algorithms that are available. And so at some level we have to just say, okay, let's d use this to define our catalogs and just say something about the errors, about what, what other objects are being um, found there. And uh, yeah. 
Okay, so um, this is just, I just have one slide on Veleski. This is another of the regions in, in Hobies, um, in the Hobies program. And so what was neat about this region was that, uh, so Tracy Hill is the author of this, uh, who studied this region here. And so she divided this region up into what she called ridges and nests. And so, and then she found, so this is an example of a ridge here, so that included this region here, and it looked very um, uh, compact with respect to its filamentary structure. And so what she found was that these, this hot gas surrounding, so here's like the hot gas surrounding the H2 region, she found that those were gravity dominated and that was where the majority of the high mass star formation was taking place. And then in the nest regions um, here, so this is where this was cold filamentary structure, turbulence dominated, and she found lesser um, amounts of, star of high mass star formation in those regions. Um, so I, so these are, so these are just um, terms that she that she developed um, to uh, to describe the regions that we saw. Um, so I'm not sure. So I would say that. Um, so I think by gravity domi dominated, that's that's what she meant by these are these are more like. Um, so coherent, so you already see these, these filamentary structures that look like they have gravitationally collapsed together, um, whereas here they're, they're just more um, uh, not as clumped together, and so they're turbulent, turbulence dominated. I don't, I don't know what her, uh, whether there was a mathematical criterion. Yeah, I think, so these, these terms, nest and ridge, I think those were just determined um, just based vi visually on this. So then, in summary, um, so Herschel is revolutionizing our knowledge of the earliest phases of star formation. It has since it, uh, since it was launched four years ago, and will continue to do so for the next however many years. <laughs> um, the Hobie's data show high mass star formation. Um, and so we definitely see the temperature gradients across these maps and perhaps age gradients. Um, and just the, the information that we can glean from the temperature, from the column density maps is something that we, can, that we will study uh, for quite some time in the future. NGC 7538 is the region that I studied most closely. Um, this is the region where we had this interesting ring structure that we don't know it's, it is of unknown origin at this point. And um, we have these several objects which are potential to form intermediate to high mass stars. And so we need to, we would like to look further into those. Um, Rosette, we perhaps see the first massive three stellar cores. So those, there, these were the um, candidates. Uh, that need that also need to be looked into with higher resolution, and then Vela C. I just showed the last slides, just that high mass stars preferentially form in ridges rather than in these nests. Thank you.